There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and to another Friday Reads. It's been a weird week. I had a lot of things to deal with personally. Not going to get into any of that, but I don't want any, but nobody needs to worry because the week is ending on a much more positive note than it began. But it certainly cut into my reading time. I barely did any reading at all this week. And as a consequence, because I don't want, I'm not going to tell you what was preoccupying me personally. I don't have any personal news. I can't think of any lighthearted personal news. Um, I got a new steamer. Um, one of those handheld, big, powerful steamers. And when I uh, took it out of the box the other day, I couldn't get it working. It said it needed to be primed, and there was no instructions on how to prime it. And I was like, oh my god, it doesn't work. And I just left it sitting there for two days. And this morning, it worked like a charm. So that finally I can wear this shirt again because this shirt, every time you wash it, it needs pressing because it's really wrinkly, but now it's all nice and pressed. Not pressed, but steamed. So that makes me happy. That's the one happy thing that happened this week. The most exciting thing, the other great thing that is not, well, it's kind of personal, but it's also very booktube news, is that I turned six. Last Saturday, I gave you a foreshadowing of that. Thanks for all your well wishes. So I'm doing the two, two of the three things I usually do to celebrate an anniversary or a milestone. I'm having book giveaways. There'll be a link to that video in the show notes. And I'm doing the camera flip where you send a video to me and I put it up on my channel. I've done those many times in the past. Unlike former years, the video about the book giveaways has not gotten nearly as many hits as the book, as the video about the camera flip. People don't like getting free books in the mail anymore what is going on like i could understand if they clicked on the video and didn't watch it looked at the show notes to find out what books were up for grabs and then didn't enter that's perfectly reasonable but to not even check to see what you might get i don't know what's going on anymore anyway several of you have entered the book giveaway and, and there's been a couple great camera flips already submitted and published and more promised in the coming days so Join in the fun. I want to see your videos. Because of Camera Flip and my regular level of content output, the Week in Review is going to be a little long, but how? what a happy problem that is. Here is the Week in Review. I started my BookTube channel six years ago today, and what a wild ride it's been. Thank you to everybody for all your support, and to thank you specifically, I'm having a book giveaway. You make a video... So you send it to me and I put it on my channel, Camera Flip. Instead of the camera being on me, the camera's on you. Hello, my name is Alina. I'm from Rotterdam in the Netherlands and I'm doing the uh, Camera Flip uh, video thing for uh, uh, Sean's uh, birth anif sixth anniversary of YouTube. Uh, I'm going to do a thing I did I did two years ago. I did a, a same uh, same kind of a video, and I uh, did uh, six continents, six books, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Only this time, it's going to be short books. Why don't you start by sharing your love for Stephen Milhauser, Trevor? Okay. Well, let me start with just a little bit of a story about a recent event, and you may know about it if you heard it on my podcast. But I have loved Stephen Milhauser's writing for a few decades now. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize in, I think, 97 for his book, Martin Dressler, um, which I, I did pull my books aside. I, I don't know if that works for you. That's great. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that one here in a few minutes. But that was the first book of his that I read. In this BookTube video, the BookTuber was doing a book haul um, and hadn't read most of the books that they had hauled. But after the haul was finished, this wasn't you, Sean, um, but... This booktuber asked viewers not to leave negative comments about the books that that had been hauled in the in the comment section and i thought this was really interesting primarily because it made me think would i am i influenced by someone else's opinion of a book in the sense that would somebody else's opinion of a book determine negate whatever what what I think about a book. So I guess to put it more nicely, and I've written it out 
so it's more comprehensive. Does BookTube influence what I like? Uh, you know, the fact that there was a whole chunk of World War One was happening in East Africa is just doesn't feature, you know, and I feel I think that must be something that Goerner feels quite strongly about. And so that's why he, he, he puts it into his novels. Yeah, uh, something that I was absolutely definitely going to mention, like we have this completely Eurocentric teaching of World, World War One, for instance, where it's just inches, trenches, trenches. And I think I'd recommend this book to a wide range of people. But I think if you're somebody that's studying history or like spending a lot of time on history and like this book will just kind of open your eyes to a huge extra portion um, of that conflict. But it's really interesting how even from page one, even from the bit that's set long before the start of the, the First World War, we get this association between colonial powers and war. And you get this, oh, and then there was this uprising, which the Europeans were putting down. And then there was this uprising and they were brutal in putting it down. And, and this kind of cyclical thing where it, you get this impression that the, con the people who are trying to control it are just locked into this perpetual cycle of, of fighting. <laughs> It just escalates to the point of the war rather than the war being something that, that came out of nowhere. All right. So I haven't had much of a reading week in terms of page count, and I don't count my pages. Don't t keep track of that. But I just haven't. There's been days that I didn't even open a book. But I have a bale to tell you about. And there's a funny story with the bale. I haven't finished anything. And I'm going to tell you about maybe three books that are that I'm well enough into that I want to check in on a preliminary, in a preliminary fashion. So before I even tell you what the bail is, this was one of my ongoing series of pseudo buddy reads with Dan, whose channel used to be called, I mean, it still is called, he just hasn't put up a video for a long, long time, The Weird Book Book Club. And he and I are great friends and we have done a series of these pseudo buddy reads where we, and if you're new to this channel, what I mean by a pseudo buddy read is that we don't have four chapters check in on Voxer type thing as we move through it. We just agree. We agree. Can you see both fingers? We agree on a rough date that will both be finished. And then we hook up on Zoom, record a chat, and I publish it. So there was one like that with Roz and Tilly about the Abdul Razak Gurna novel in the weekly highlights this week. How we do it, how Dan and I do it, is I give him a list of four or five books and he chooses one and that's the buddy read. And then we switch. He gives me a list of four or five books, and I choose one, and we go with that one. So it was my turn, and I gave him a list of, I think it was all mostly new releases, queer fiction. And he chose one, and he could get it through Interlibrary Loan, so he started reading it, and I said, okay, well, I can commit to be finished by such and such a date. And then I think I, I actually don't remember if I delayed it. A couple times but I'm famous for doing that especially in 2023 because I'm taking on too many of these things I finally said okay I can commit to meeting up with you on zoom Wednesday of the next week which was this past Wednesday and I and I, by which point I wasn't quite halfway through but I had figured out how much I needed to read a day to be ready by then and it was doable I think it was like I don't know how many pages it was a day it doesn't matter and then I just got, I got to the halfway point and I thought, you know what? This novel sucks. It's really bad. I don't think, if Dan feels similarly to me, meanwhile he'd been finished for a couple weeks. If Dan feels like this, maybe we shouldn't bother recording a video. We can still chat about it. So that was the message I sent. Maybe I was being a little devious because what happened was he said, yeah, it wasn't very good at all. I <laughs> didn't really like it. Let's not record a chat. He, he said, let's just do, because we had another project to collaborate on. He said, let's do that other project instead on Wednesday, not even bother recording the chat. So then I thought, well, that gives me permission to bail because I was still fully prepared to read it just to, you know, have a private chat with Dan about how, how awful it was. But uh, now, now I just said, oh, well, if, you're, if that's what we're going to do, I'm not going to bother finishing it. So without further ado, we didn't really like and I couldn't finish. This debut novel from India, One Small Voice by Santanu Bharacharya, published this year. And I, I, I've already been a little snide about it, about the fact that I thought it was awful. I do think it was awful. But it's got a high rating on Goodreads, which is why I'm allowing myself to get a little ranty. 
and I don't think an an Indian novelist who's being published in India and the West it doesn't quite fit my criteria of a marginalized writer and the fact that it's gotten a lot of re a lot of very glowing reviews means that maybe you shouldn't listen to me but that also I want to add some some balance to all those glowingly positive reviews because I thought this was really boring and the protagonist was not interesting he wasn't in an interesting character the opening premise is that he it's very important in what I'm about to explain about the opening premise to understand that the protagonist is a small boy, like seven, eight, nine years old when this thing happens at the beginning of the story. He is at a wedding party and he goes out into the backyard at this wedding hall or wherever he is. And he's, and it's in the middle of a bunch of the terrible riots that so many Muslims were killed in 1992. And he witnesses an act of mob violence that traumatizes him for the rest of his life. The fact that he witnessed it is not unbelievable, but the way that it was narrated and the way that he carries it as a secret and doesn't tell his family, despite it just happening outside the, the hall, and he comes back in and he never, ever, I mean, maybe he does by the end of the novel, but as a child, through to adulthood, where I got to the halfway mark, he had never told anybody what he saw. And I just didn't think that was believable. And he wasn't a very interesting character, and the story really dragged, and it was marketed. I'm sure I saw some reference to it as being a gay novel. There was nothing gay happening in the first half, and Dan said there was one threesome that had a little bit of gay activity that, you know, half a page. Other than that, no clear content. For all of those reasons, this was a complete and utter dud for me, and, and that's what I have to say. I'm going to check in on three books now. I'm halfway through Voting Day by Claire O'D. This is a buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life, and we read the first half this week. And I have a mixed reaction to it. As I told you last week, it's set on Voting Day in February 1959 in Switzerland. It's a referendum on should women get the vote? Yes, women did not have the vote in 1959 in Switzerland. And the referendum failed. It's historical. It's not a spoiler. But it's a historical fact. They didn't get it for several more years after that. And this is a novella about the lives of at least three different women. And the first two are a mother and a daughter, and an adult daughter. And the chapter about the mother, the kind of grandmotherly person in the story, Vreni, was spellbinding and beautifully written. And I just sank into it. And I thought, oh my god, this novel is going to be so good. And that was told in the third person. And the second chapter was her daughter. So the mother was coming into the big city, which I don't think is ever identified, for surgery. And she was going to have to be in hospital and in kind of a recovery place for a few weeks. And she was really looking forward to it. She was a pig farmer's wife, worked to the bone, really looking forward to having a rest as she went in for surgery. And also the chance to spend time with her daughter, who was living and working in the big city. Chapter two, we switched to the point of view of the daughter told in the first person and from the first paragraph I hated it the first person voice was so well I didn't think it was well told and the shift was so jarring and the daughter this adult daughter she was so superficial and ditzy and unlikable to me and I kept thinking to myself Sean there may be a method in the author's madness that she may be showing how uh, such a misogynistic society would create women like this, that that is, that she's doing it very intentionally. And so I tried to <laughs> withhold my, but she was just like, uh, uh, she was uh, working in an office and she had to endure horrific sexual harassment, not just harassment, but certainly harassment. And that was believable. Her romantic life, her self-esteem and her identification with how attractive she was to men, again, it makes sense, but it sounded like something out of like a really badly done commercial fiction novel. I just couldn't stand her. And it was, why did she change the point of view? Why didn't she keep it in? I felt like giving her that kind of a really whiny voice 
stripped her of the dignity that Brenny got through the third person point of view. So Heidi didn't have the reaction Heidi did. She could understand why I had the reaction. So I, you know, I got to take off my male reader glasses and, and try to inhabit the second half of it. But I felt extremely let down by the second chapter and kind of hated it. Even the, the writing, there's a, when the mother and the daughter go to confront the sexual harasser at his home, there's just a madcap journey through town that was so badly written, it was just unbelievable. It, it was just, I thought, poor writing and a mistake to change the point of view. Give, give us the third person that accords that character the grace and dignity that we can see her from different facets like we did her mother. And uh, I'm hoping for better things in the second half. The first chapter was fabulous. The second chapter didn't work for me at all. So, we'll carry on. I have now read two stories in this debut collection of queer short stories from Australia, or from an Australian writer, Paul Dalla Rosas, An Exciting and Vivid Inner Life, which is a really ironic title, because these, story, these first two stories are about gay men whose inner lives are... Well, he does render them. Oh, this is actually a great comparison. He does in the first two stories what I thought Claire O'D failed miserably at doing in the second chapter of this novel. He does write in such an interesting, deep way about his queer male characters that are really like the uh, dealing with addiction issues and seeming to care about nothing other than drugs and sex and fashion. And he renders their characters and their narratives in a way that was really deep. So he made them th that really boring plotline. I mean, gay men who that's all they care about bore me to tears. But these stories were delightful, really solid. I'm very impressed by the writing. So now I think, what were the point of views in these stories? So now that I've realized what, a, what an important comparison I'm drawing between these two. These two short stories were in first person. So it's not just the switch from third person to first person that I, I can't just hang my whole critique on that because these were rich indeed. Anyway, I have some more thinking to do about what what was going on in that that last novella. I'm not sure I have anything else to say. I never know how to talk about a collection of short stories. The first one is in Dubai. And he's teaching English, I think, and he is isolated. Whenever he can get out of the the shoebox, high-rise apartment where he's been billeted or where he's been put, he goes down to the local bar and he drinks with people and does stupid things. But it all had an almost Virginia Woolf depth to it. It just sang that story, and the second one was equally good. And it's about a young guy whose boyfriend... I don't think we know where the second story is set, but I'm assuming it's Australia, but could be somewhere else. And his biracial Chinese white boyfriend is traveling around the world to find himself and, and just keeping in touch with his lover, our protagonist, through Instagram posts and um, um, cyber sex. And... Our protagonist is the manager of a really she-she haute culture, is that how you pronounce that? Haute culture clothes shop that's so exclusive that there's no sign on the door and it's in a back alley. You have to know it's there. And the owner of this, a Japanese woman who's very mysterious and at the apex of the fashion world, she's coming to pay the shop a visit for the first time ever. And so it's all the preparations getting ready for that as he's dealing with all the stuff in his personal life. And he gets the bright idea to find some older clothes that this woman had designed back in the day that are not, you can't buy them new anymore, but they're on sale for, they, you can buy them on eBay. And so he buys a, I don't know what the hell it was, something that you wear on the top half of your body, whether it was a, sweater jacket or what the hell it was um, for $4,000 on eBay because he thinks it will impress her when she walks into the store if he's wearing this that's you can't find it's hard to find and it's from her early days when it gets delivered to his house he puts it on and he 
realizes how ugly it is. It doesn't fit him at all. So he can't return it. The, the, they won't take it back. And so he decides to order something else from the same eBay seller that, that he does like better. So he spends, you know, almost $10,000 on fashion that he doesn't really... You know, garments that he doesn't need just to impress. And then the story goes from there. It's, it's, there's, there's humor in it. And there's a depth to the characterization that makes these stories... Sean's stories indeed... And I would say the thing I'm most excited about, because I had the least expectation, and, and because this was a book that was put on my radar by Lindy, and she and I don't always agree, but when we agree, we deeply agree. And that is the first book of this trilogy by an Edmonton, Alberta, Canada writer, Wendy McGrath Santa Rosa. When I look at her picture, I don't, she doesn't look nearly as Anglo-Saxon Protestant as her name does. And I've just found online that she's described in one on one web page only as a Métis writer. So I have to ask Lindy about that. She may have told me and I've forgotten. Regardless, this has just grabbed me by the heart. It is very poetic, but it's not so poetic that it's off-putting because if it was too poetic, I wouldn't have gotten as far into it as I have gotten. This is what it looks like on the page, but you can read it as prose, but it's very imagistic. There's a lots of I don't use the word symbols because I don't really believe in them. I believe in images. And then you, the reader, get to ascribe meaning to them. Symbols are bullshit, just like religion. Um, <laughs> the moon does not have one meaning only, people. Am I ranting? I'm ranting. I don't want to rant. This is, a, this is just beautiful, very tender. The prologue shows a couple neighbors who live side by side. That's what neighbors mean, Sean, presumably in Edmonton. Uh, the young married couple are expecting. The woman has developed a severe craving to eat dirt. And so it explores all that in a very poetic, imagistic way. Meanwhile, the neighbor next door, we don't get as much about him, but he's a fairly young widower, not as young as she is, but, you know, maybe he's 50. And I believe he's a baker by trade, but he's certainly a baker by by skill and he makes a certain kind of cake i don't know if he's german but the ger the cake is a german cake is it named that his father taught him how to make without ever committing the recipe to paper i think it might be a bunt cake certainly he uh, makes it in an, an old battered bunt pan and then it's buried in the earth so he buries it after he makes it and how lovingly he wraps it puts it in the box that they think it's the same box that his father used and it's so sensuous all of those details buries it and then we get a little bit of crossover between the two neighbors but it was just gorgeous i loved it so much and today i read the first chapter we are in the point of view of a young girl she might be 10 or 7 who gets taken to the fair by her parents and she has a younger sister, so I think there's been quite a time jump, and that this, these two girls, it's their parents that we're expecting in the in the prologue, but I don't know that for sure. But it's also really vivid and, and, and beautiful. But I am bowled over by how much I love this so far. This is part of a trilogy. The third volume just was published in 2019. Very, very impressive. I'm very, very different. So those are the three that are in progress. So what am I going to start? I'm not going to start very much because I didn't finish very much. The one that I'm worried about forgetting to tell you. Let me start with it. For Straya September, I am going to start the audiobook of the poems, the Stella Prize winning collection of poems, The Jaguar by Sarah Holland Batt. One of my subscribers and patrons, Robin, just read it uh, a week ago, I think, and she said it was one of her top reads of the year. I'm doing it exclusively on audio because I can't affordably get a copy of the text, but the audio is wonderful, narrated by the author, and it's poems about her father's experience with Parkinson's. Looking forward to that. Sarah from the wonderful podcast, The Bookcast Club, put her on my radar when, we did, when I did that episode with her and Jenny about the Stella Prize long list, the... What was, the Woman's Prize Long List and the Carol Shields Prize Long List. And I had never heard of this collection until then. And she said it's a collection of poetry 
that people who don't think they like poetry really need to try. So that that's me. I am going to try The Animals by Carrie Fagan as part of my Shorty September. This is a strange little novella that I've heard. I don't think I've heard anything bad about it. I'm just worried because it's described as a realist novel with the air of a fairy tale. Depending on how much air, how much fairy tale air there is in it, I'm a little nervous. But other than that, I'm a big fan of Carrie Fagan. His novella, The Student, is one of my favorite Canadian works of fiction of all time. So let's get into his latest one. And finally, I'm going to keep you in suspense as to why. But I'm adding another novella to my Shorty September TBR at the last minute. I will explain why in a future episode of Friday Reads. This is a novella by a Korean-American novelist. Her name is Esther Yi, and the novella is called YN. Is it, in other words, what, yes, no? I think it stands for yes, no. It typically does, but it may not in this novel. I'll tell you that later, but it is called Y slash N. YN by Esther Yi. All I know about it, and I don't want to know another thing about it until I start it, I've got an e-copy, an e-book I'm borrowing through, from the library through Libby, is that it has to do with, I think it's a female protagonist who gets obsessed with a K-pop, Korean pop, K-pop star or band, and it gets a little surreal. I love K-pop, not as much as I love J-pop, but I do love K-pop. Uh, I loved K-pop before K-pop was a thing in the West, because I taught Korean students, a lot of Korean students, in Can ESL in Canada, and they introduced me to some K-pop bands and attractive young hot male singers. So I've been kind of following K-pop since for more than 15 years. Uh, anyway, so this sounded like it was something that I would enjoy. I don't know if I will, but I'm going to start it this week. Published in March this year. That is my Friday Reads. And I hope you are reading some great stuff. Thanks for watching. Ooh.